Hi, I'm Mrs. Aziz. This is Baby Aziz. Welcome to our classroom. Today we're going to be talking to you about reciprocal teaching, and I'm going to show you one of the variations that I use in my classroom. First of all, a few reasons why you should use reciprocal teaching and why I use it. Students speak a common language. They often understand each other in ways that they might not understand a teacher, or they can clarify terms with each other that maybe we overlook as teachers. Um, reciprocal teaching allows students to become the teacher in a small group setting, which increases active listening, active responses, and your small group mentality helps these students to kind of build their own summary, right, and be proud of their work. So the four principles that we're going to be working with, we're going to kind of put a little variation on them today, are our standard Fab Four with the reciprocal teaching method. Um, our first principle is generating questions, then we're going to be looking at predicting, clarifying, and overall summarizing. Again, I do a little spin on that. My students are really familiar with my approach to reciprocal teaching, so they know what to expect from me, so I like to get a little bit more in-depth analysis with my questions and with each of those stages. So first, I'd like to walk you through what my lesson would look like before I kind of jump into that small group setting. We are in class right now tying together the idea of speaking ethically with our First Amendment rights. We're going to combine that into a text, um, JFK, John F. Kennedy's President in the Press. So we're going to be looking at that free press idea and those ideas of speaking ethically. And then the students will be able to break into their small groups and be able to analyze the text together and bring an overall summary to each section of the text to the class. So, Normally, what I would do, for our purposes today, I'm not going to um, translate my notes over, but I like my students, I'm, most of my speech classes are freshmen and sophomore, so they're still learning the skills needed for proper note taking. So what I do is we analyze our slides, um, but as they're listening, I like to write the terms and definitions that I want them to pull from each slide on the board behind me. So they kind of get an idea of how to um, look through content and really pull out the more important pieces with that. When we get to the end of our lesson, of course we do a recap. And then my first stage, my first step before breaking into small group setting is listening and annotating the speech itself. Some teachers, and depending on the setting that you're working with, you might want the student to use the predictive method of the text before hearing it or experiencing it. In my case, some of my speeches are lengthier and a lot of the vocabulary used in it, the students might not be familiar with, they haven't heard it. So I like them to get that pronunciation for it, the feel for it, and overall just be able to listen to the speech before they jump into it so they know what's going on. Um, in this case, this is a tougher text and they need a little bit of a historical background before reading the speech, so I like to set them up with that. This is the area also that um, my accommodations come into play. So ELLs, ESL students, I will put subtitles at the bottom so they can follow along kind of listening for cues and then also um, underlining and commenting. So when they break into their small group setting, they'll already have some ideas about the text. After we analyze, I like to get the kids into their small group setting. So this is my variation of reciprocal teaching. The students still work in groups of four, and each student has one role or responsibility in the group. It's very important that you make it clear whose responsibility it is in the group. That way they're not um, competing for answers, or they're not talking over each other. Everybody gets a platform and is respected within the group. The way I select my groups is with a deck of playing cards, right? I shuffle my cards. That way there's no arguing over groups. Everybody gets an equal chance. The really important part of reciprocal teaching is that all the students share a platform together. It's not more advanced students tutoring struggling students. Um, it's more of a collaborative effort from everybody. So, after I've shuffled my cards, each student selects a card at random. Their card indicates what group they will be in and what their role in the group will be. So after I'm able to get each, a card to each student, they sit, they will be placed in their groups, 
and then they can really start to look at what their role in the group is. In this case, it's a spade, so that's my historian. The historian is the one who's gonna be looking kind of at predicting, right? They're gonna use um, historical facts that they know or that we pulled from previous lessons and discussions about this time period to make assumptions or predictions about what is going on in this speech and what President Kennedy might be saying. Now my word finder, that's the, that's the more simple role of the group, um, but also equally important, that's the clarifier. They go through and look at everyone in the group's underlying words, they're gonna look them up on the dictionary, and then kind of translate them into their own meaning. That way they can be a little bit more clear. I also like them to explain why that word was chosen for the text. I think it's important to not only understand the word, but look at its placement in the text also. For my clubs, in this case, ethics and literary devices, this is really about generating questions. So that's that fab four element from reciprocal teaching. As they're looking through, I want them to be combining that First Amendment lecture with my speaking ethically lecture to generate questions about the overall ethics and literary devices used in this speech. How are they effective? What purpose do they serve in the speech? To kind of generate those questions within each other. And that all leads us up to that purpose and meaning. Your overall goal in reciprocal teaching is increasing comprehension of the text. So your end goal is having children be able to summarize that text. Our students need to be able to look at a big chunk that may be overwhelming and break it down to a point where it's easy to understand and they can put it in their own terminology. So my purpose and meaning, person in the group, kind of combines everybody's ideas and thoughts on the overall text and they come up with a summary. That is also the person who shares their ideas with the entire class. They go up as a group but one individual will summarize what everybody worked on. That is my favorite part of the process, and that's really where I can see the assessment element of it. What are these students working, what are they struggling with with each other, um, and what's really working for them? And that way, when my formal assessment comes, I can kind of see per group what stands out in the speech and what needs to be kind of left behind in it. My last note on reciprocal teaching, too, is it takes practice. You have to be very patient with it. At first, students might be really nervous. Your shyer students might not want to work with certain group members or come up in front of the class. But with practice, if you just keep repeating the process, I really can see a great increase in comprehension and, and how it benefits students, not only for teamwork, but motivation towards the text versus that kind of shutting down mentality that happens when you're working individually in these small group settings. They're able to be very active and motivated towards that text. So I hope you learned a little bit about reciprocal teaching today um, and a different variation of a way to use it in your classroom. And I hope you appreciated the lecture. Thank you.